These are 15 things I wish I knew about Apex when I first started that I know now. Hopefully by sharing them with you, they'll help you become a better player. So let's get into it. Number one, all legends move at the same speed. However, they all have their own unique movement animations. Now I used to be convinced the bigger legends like Caustic and Gibby moved slower because it really truly feels like they do, but they don't. They also have their own footstep audio sound, so getting used to what each legend sounds like as they're moving can really help you out as you get in more fights. Oftentimes we're gonna go off what we're hearing before we're able to see our enemies to gauge how to combat them. So legends like Pathfinder, Revenant, and Ash all have some pretty distinct footstep sounds. Number two, how many heals I should carry. I swear early on I just grabbed whatever I could and didn't really comprehend what was a necessary amount of health and shields to be holding. So this is obviously a variable which is dependent on what you can find and what backpack size you have, but a general rule of thumb is you're gonna want two med kits, four syringes, eight to 12 shield cells, and two to four shield batteries. If you have four shield batteries, you only really need eight cells, but if you only have two shield batteries and you have a bigger backpack, then I typically run 12 shield cells until I can find more batteries. Phoenix kits are optional and I typically pick one up if I have no bats or maybe only one bat. But a common mistake is players will carry way too many health meds and this will waste a ton of your backpack space. Obviously your armor gets hit first, so there's no need to carry an abundance of health meds unless you're making a lengthy rotation in the zone where your health is depleting fast. Players also overlook the importance of having shield batteries. I can't emphasize enough how important shield batteries are to have and use during so many fights. Number three, learning to drop. Now this is an area that every player struggles with whether they like to admit it or not. But early on I wish I knew some ways to figure out where loot actually spawned and where it did not. A lot of time was wasted exploring spots that, yeah sure, were important to see, but didn't spawn any loot, or only very little. Any named place on the map will be what they call a named point of interest. They obviously spawn more loot than the no-name areas. If you land as a team at a place that doesn't spawn much loot, it could set the whole game up for a disaster. I also wish I knew how to contest a team for when they dropped near my squad. I know a lot of players early on love to three-man land on anybody they see and just try to punch them out. Now, of course, this can work out, but it can also wind up going terribly, and I would say, in fact, most of the times, it will. The first thing to do on any drop is just free look around to see where within the POI enemies are landing, and then by seeing that, you'll be able to decide where you have a good chance of getting some loot yourself. Very rarely is it a good idea to land directly on top of one another to see who gets lucky enough to pick up the first weapon they see. So in conclusion, you want a free look, you want to land at places that actually spawn loot, and enough of it for your whole team, and remember where places are on the map so you become more familiar with them. Number four, the importance of Legends abilities. Now this sounds super obvious on the surface, but I can tell you confidently, players of all skill overlook this even today. There's always new people arising in content creation who have mastered a legend in ways that we didn't even think was possible. So the biggest thing I have is just realize that all 22 legends have three abilities, and some technically even have more than that. So learn what they are, learn how to use most of them, and pay attention to which legends you are fighting against each and every fight to gauge how to deal with their abilities. The sooner you really apply this one, the better of a player you will become. Number five, how to detect a Mirage decoy versus the real one. So when Mirage uses his ultimate, look for the brief flickering of blue and white. This is the real Mirage actively decloaking in front of you. If Mirage uses his ultimate, but you weren't able to see him activate it, then look for the one who is moving in the most probable direction, either towards you or away from you if they are trying to escape and heal. People tend to panic early on as soon as they see a decoy, but just stop for a second and think, wait, where's the most likely direction this player is going to head towards? If Mirage sends out his tactical or his ultimate, the loud footstep audio is deliberate on the decoys, so if you hear what you think is an enemy, it's probably the decoy. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. Number six, I wish I rewatched my gameplay footage more often. I can't tell you how many times I've done coaching sessions where we look back at a player's unedited gameplay session and we assess the mistakes they're making, and they say something like, wow, I never even realized I was doing that. Or damn, I never saw it like that before. Rewatching the footage is crucial to seeing mistakes in your gameplay. And if you don't care about getting coaching, you can do it on your own. Just look at some of the top players' gameplay and then look at yours and find the differences. Number seven, when your teammates go down, you're gonna feel this impending urge to run in and try to save the day. Don't. Well, not always. 
running in blindly to go and help your teammates once they go down when you know nothing about the circumstances is going to be a foolish move you're going to make it easy on your enemy to not only eliminate you but your entire team so many times while solo queuing you'll have a teammate that gets knocked in a position that you have no line of sight on they may offer no pings or any words about the situation go slow and assess everything you can this is such a common mistake newer players make and they do it out of the goodness of their heart they're trying to help their teammates but they're doing it in the wrong way obviously there's a ton of nuance with this one but i can tell you attacking a team on a one by one approach is not a recipe for success so keep this in mind while you embark on your apex journey number eight map awareness and positioning is everything having an awareness of your surroundings will make up a huge chunk of the skill gap in apex remember where you're at where you've been and where you're trying to go pay attention to the zone timer and where it's pulling to for people who've played a ton of battle royales before this may be more second nature to them and if you're anything like me and you didn't come from a history of playing brs well yeah this part will be pretty difficult to grasp in the beginning but once you do i'm telling you it will make such a huge difference in your gameplay you will no longer find yourself in positions being like why am i here when this guy clearly has this better angle over me and i just got lit up from them you'll be thinking much more clearly about where you want to be and where you want to take a fight Number nine, gold helmet gives legends a 20% cooldown on both of their abilities, tactical and ultimates. It also gives you a 65% headshot reduction, which is great. But in most instances, you want to recognize who the gold helmet should go to on the squad and who it should not go to. Obviously, every legend could benefit from a gold helmet, but if there's only one, you definitely want to decide who it will be best on within your squad. Let's say you're playing a ranked match and you have a legend like Bloodhound or Seer. But I could tell you the gold helmet should probably go to them over someone like Lifeline or even Newcastle. Because the recon abilities are so helpful for the entire squad, that's going to fare much better than using it on a legend like Lifeline who really doesn't need her abilities that quickly. But you can also alternate the gold helmet once one legend uses their ultimate. So let's say you have a Wraith on your team and she uses her portal. Well, she's got a three and a half minute cooldown on her ultimate. If you already have your ultimate and you're the one with the gold helmet, just swap helmets with her briefly so that she has a shorter cooldown to regain her ultimate again. This whole thing obviously works much better with a pre-made squad than it does with random teammates. But even if you are solo queuing, you can have the courtesy to ping the gold helmet to the legend on your team that will benefit from it. Number 10, why do dead slides happen? In the majority of situations, they can be prevented. And here's how. As a rule of thumb in Apex, during most animations, they need to fully complete before you can move on to the next thing. Meaning, let's say I'm climbing. I can't have my weapon out to shoot unless I reach the top of what I'm climbing or until I drop back down. So it's a similar philosophy for dead slides. If you have your weapon out and you try to slide during your holster animation, it could give you a dead slide because the animation isn't completed. And obviously with a weapon out, you move slower. If you're trying to slide with your weapon out, however, it's one, two, three, then slide. You do need some momentum in order for this to be a success. But if you are holstered, you can slide basically immediately. However, it could give you a dead slide if you try to pull your weapon out mid slide, as that then slows you back down. Now, obviously things such as map terrain and latency can affect this as well, but I hope that clarifies some things around dead slides. Number 11, ammo is carried in stacks of even numbers. So if you have an odd amount, you're either holding too much or not enough. If we look at the three most common ammo types of energy, light, and heavy, they all stack in backpack slots of 60. So you wanna be holding anywhere from 120, 240, or 300. So as a general rule of thumb, if it's for your primary weapon, you wanna have either 240 or 300 ammo, ideally. This is obviously contingent on your backpack size and how much ammo you can find. But let's say you're holding something like 90 bullets for your R301 and you see more light ammo. You should know that you can carry 120 and it will take up the same amount of backpack space. Becoming proficient with your looting will really speed up the learning curve in Apex. And I say that confidently as I've done thousands of hours of coaching players in this game. Number 12. The same concept also applies to the healing items. Most of them will be carried in even numbers. If you're holding five shield cells, you can be holding eight of them and it takes up the same amount of backpack space. So watch out for odd numbers of healing items in your inventory. This whole thing just centers around maximizing the space you have with the supplies you can carry. Number 13, movement techniques. 
It's crazy to think that Apex has been out for years now and we're still discovering new movement tech every season. The important thing I wish I knew was what movement to focus on, however. A lot of newer players think that learning to tap strafe or to super glide are the keys to becoming some sweaty player. And while yes, they can certainly help, it's definitely not what I think most should concern themselves with. The movement tech that I wish I focused on was just sliding, jumping, crouching, strafing, and then eventually wall bouncing. All of these mechanics are most commonly used game in and game out. And then after that, the next technique I would be learning was how to quickly interact on zip lines. I would have focused on these things in that order. A lot of the advanced movement gets embellished by other content creators, and that's cool and all, but I just want to keep it real that the majority of fights do not require or even allow for those techniques to play a big factor in the outcome of the gunfight. Number 14, your settings. I remember really early on in Apex, some random person I was playing with mentioned changing around some of the settings Apex originally puts you on. At first, I didn't really believe this person because I thought, well, whatever the game put me on should be correct. But boy, was I wrong. There's plenty of changes you can make within your settings, but one that made a huge difference for me early on was changing my field of view. For some reason, Apex puts this number on 70 originally, which is the lowest it can possibly be on. So I was instructed to change it to 100. Now I play on 110, which is the highest it can possibly be on. This change was huge for so many reasons. It really just expanded the perspective of the game and it allowed me to see so many more enemies that weren't just directly in front of my face. Number 15, changing your sensitivity. Now, very similar to changing your settings, you most likely are going to want to tweak your sensitivity, whether you play on controller or mouse and keyboard. Now, I've gone into this more in depth in some previous videos, but I do think that finding the right sensitivity for you is going to be a huge variable in all of the outcomes for your games in Apex. I've coached players before who've been playing on the wrong sensitivity for months. They didn't even know their DPI was like super high or super low. And then same with controller players as well. They're playing on some complicated ALC setting when really they didn't need to. So to each their own, but still you're probably going to want to tweak some things with your sensitivity. If you found this video helpful and you're interested in four legends that are used incorrectly, I suggest you check out this video next. Thanks for watching. Peace.